My name is Shimon Vedovinsky and I'm a research professor at the University of Miami. Well, it's, I've started uh, in geodesy uh, doing my uh, PhD studies. I was a student at uh, Harvard University and my uh, advisor, Rick O'Connell, was uh, on the board of UNAVCO. And uh, he encouraged me to learn this new uh, technology and uh, to apply it in my research. So uh, during that time, it was the early day of uh, GPS, uh, we had uh, seminars uh, between uh, Harvard and MIT about space geodesy. The early days were about uh, VLBI, SLR, and in also introduced uh, GPS. So that was the, uh, the very beginning. And then uh, I really got interested in that. And uh, I, uh, I wanted to go to the field. And uh, in 1988, uh, three years through my uh, dissertation, I uh, joined uh, the team uh, of uh, that went to Turkey, uh, who, who was the uh, the PI uh, from MIT, Rob Rob Rylinger. Yeah, sorry about that, and please edit it <laughs> with Rob Rylinger. And uh, I was supposed to go to Turkey. I came here to Inafco to do the uh, the training. And I was ready to go to Turkey, but uh, then uh, my, uh, I couldn't go because the Turkish government uh, said that only Turkish citizen and American citizen can join the uh, campaign over there. And since I have an Israeli, I had the Israeli passport at the time, I couldn't join. So I was very disappointed and went back to Boston. I couldn't participate in that. And a year later, I went with Mike Beavis to the Southwest Pacific. So that was, uh, in 1989, was my first time doing uh, active GPS measurement uh, with UNAVCO. I, uh, I don't call myself a geodesist. I call myself a geophysicist that use geodetic measurements and actively pursue geodetic measurements because the science of geodesy is uh, the people who do that, they learn how to do very precise measurement and they, they care about the uncertainties and not the application. I'm actually doing uh, application. I use the geodetic measurement, apply them to different geological, hydrological problems, and that's why I call myself a uh, geophysicist. Uh, well, uh, as I mentioned before, I started using uh, geodetic measurement when I was a graduate student at Harvard, but I didn't apply it to my research. Uh, when I finished my uh, PhD, I, uh, I, went, I did a postdoc with uh, Dr. Yehuda Bach from Scripps, and uh, over there we start uh, applying uh, geodetic measurements uh, to study crustal deformation, and I, I had the uh, privilege to be part of a PGGA, Permanent uh, GPS uh, Geodetic uh, Array. It was the first uh, permanent uh, network that uh, was built in the US and uh, from there I took off and uh, did a lot of uh, GPS measurements. When I used the, uh, my early experience when I used the GPS measurement was to measure uh, plate uh, motion, tectonic plate motion, and crustal deformation of the earthquake deformation cycle. And we did that uh, very well in California. We were very lucky because our network uh, captured the uh, Landers earthquake. And we had uh, very interesting results. We had a very short uh, a span of observation before the earthquake and then afterwards, but uh, we learned so much out of that. Of the uh, UNAVCO facility really helped uh, researchers uh, to study tectonic plate motion. That was a, the very early uh, measurement that uh, we took and we learned. Then crustal deformation, uh, what happens in between large earthquakes, during earthquakes, and after earthquakes. So these are the, the two things. And uh, I would say the, the third uh, is uh, related to groundwater 
changes non-tectonic uh, motion. And I think uh, the GNET in uh, Greenland is a wonderful example of that, that uh, how the melt of the ice uh, results in uh, rebound of the crust in uh, Greenland. And uh, this network uh, really helped to capture that. The the main uh, advantages, uh, technical advantages uh, from UNIFCO that helped was the GPS. Uh, first, uh, the campaign GPS, uh, when we went uh, the early days and uh, carried the heavy equipment and just uh, observed in the middle of the night uh, three hours of uh, satellites uh, somewhere in the southwest Pacific. Uh, it was really uh, challenging and uh, it was uh, really great moments of the GPS. So campaign GPS and then uh, a permanent uh, GPS stations, uh, although in the beginning we started it without UNAVCO, but the PBO really uh, helped uh, facilitate uh, large-scale uh, measurement of uh, a, a permanent GPS uh, stations and uh, all the archive uh, that is available. And uh, the third one is the um, terrestrial LiDAR, uh, which uh, help uh, in different direction. Uh, me, uh, myself, uh, we benefit from that uh, in studying uh, actually uh, ecological uh, problems. Uh, we applied a, a terrestrial LIDAR to study uh, the volumes of uh, trees in wetlands, uh, in the Everglades, and my student, Emmanuel uh, Feliciano, uh, mastered that using one of the a instrument here from UNAVCO, and uh, we just have a paper that soon going to be published about that. So, oh, the future for geodesy. Uh, it's uh, it's really it's hard to foresee the, the future, but uh, we can uh, have some guesses. Uh, regarding uh, the terrestrial measurement GPS, I think uh, we'll have many more. Uh, GPS, permanent GPS, that will uh, provide us a, a lot of uh, measurements and dense network with instruments that will talk to one another and will uh, provide us the data. Uh, optimization of data processing, which almost exists. Uh, so this is about uh, terrestrial measurements, uh, SAR measurements, or in SAR measurements. Uh, this is coming up soon. I'm uh, going to have constellation of satellites. Uh, we'll be able to get uh, in some measurements uh, very frequent, uh, maybe once a day, and uh, integration between the GPS and the INSAR and other terrestrial measurements will provide us with really a uh, huge amount of data or information about the spatial distribution and the high temporal uh, resolution, so a lot of observation. New technologies, uh, we know that, uh, let's say, like the LiDAR came up and uh, changed things, so LiDAR will also become more available. And uh, it's hard to think, uh, well, it's hard for me to think what will be the next technology, but uh, it's uh, very clear it's going to come up in, uh, probably in, in a few years, in, within the next decade. Uh, so it's hard to for, uh, foresee what's going to be.